Take your Bibles and go to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Um, the last Sunday night we were here, uh, t- two weeks ago, I preached a message on the uh, prodigal son and I kind of showed the real message of the prodigal son. And then that morning I had uh, looked at, uh, we had looked at the parable of the unjust steward in um, Luke chapter 16, in the beginning of it. And so, and when you go through Luke chapter, really Luke chapter 11 through 16, I mean, it really almost all kind of, you need to read it all at once. It didn't all happen at the same time, but there, it's kind of like a building message that you get through out of it, throughout it. And when you get to Luke chapter 16, verse 19, this is the famous story. I don't believe this is a parable because Jesus gave actual names. He said, you know, I believe this was something that actually happened, but this is a famous story of the rich man and Lazarus. And we all know this story. Uh, you all have heard it a million times. And usually when this passage is preached on, it's usually going to be a message about hell. Okay, And it is pretty hot out. It would have been probably appropriate to preach on hell today. But that's not what I'm preaching on today, even though uh, I believe 100% in hell, believe it's real. And I believe it's a lot hotter than it is uh, around here. <laughs> and so, But um, there's a, there was a message, though. There was a, a main message that Jesus was trying to get across in this story, and I want to show you that the real message of the story of the rich man and Lazarus. It's not just about hell, okay? While hell is a big part of it. And in verse 19, we'll start reading the story. It says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that ye may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they will not, uh, if they will not hear, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So most of the time when you hear this passage preached, it's going to be a message about hell. And I think that, that, I do think that's appropriate. Uh, and while I believe, you know, um, while I believe that passage is about hell, I believe that we learn some of the doctrines about hell in that passage. When Jesus told this story, the main purpose of the story was he wasn't introducing these people to hell. They knew about hell. He was trying to teach them some a very important message that we, I think we all need to understand. I think we, uh, even as believers, even though you're believers today, even if you're saved. Something that will help us maybe understand kind of what we're up against. If you're a soul winner, if you're somebody who tries to witness, I think this will help you. But basically, the whole moral of that story, the whole purpose of that story, the lesson that Jesus was trying to teach is that if you won't believe the Bible, you won't believe anything. That was the whole point. Uh, one of the main points in that story, if you won't believe the Bible, you won't believe anything. Here this man is in hell, and he's thinking, you know, send Lazarus back. Raise him from the dead so he could go and he could tell my five brothers about this place called hell. And Jesus or Abraham tells them they have Moses and the prophets. That's what they call the Old Testament. The books of Moses and the prophets. Those were warning enough right there. And, and Abraham saying, you know, they don't need a man to come back from the dead because they have the scriptures. And then he said, no, they will listen if somebody comes back from the dead. And Abraham said, no, if they won't hear Moses and the prophets, they're not going to listen even if somebody came back from the dead. And that's the moral of that story is that 
People aren't going to listen. If they won't listen to scriptures, they're not going to listen to anything. I listened to a Baptist preacher one time. You know, he was making this crazy argument. He was teaching that, uh, you know, before the rapture comes, 40 days before the rapture comes, all the dead in Christ are going to rise and they're going to walk the earth and they're going to warn people and they're going to tell them that, hey, you know, Jesus is coming. And I'm, you know, he's telling that. And I was there when he was telling the story and I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And first of all, that's not what the dead in Christ rise first means. You know, and I won't go into that, what that means right now. But he said that they're going to rise 40 days earlier. And he's talking about how effective it would be if somebody rose from the dead and were going and telling everybody about their, you know, telling their families. I mean, you know, what would you do? You know, you go tell your family. You'd be going and, you know, finding whoever you could. And he's talking about how effective that would be. And I'm sitting there, I'm thinking that wouldn't be effective at all. The Bible, I'm sitting there and I'm back there while he's saying this. And I, I'm just, I, I'm mouthing it. I'm saying it out loud with the guy next to me. We can hear him. I'm like, if they won't hear Moses and the prophets, they won't believe though one rose from the dead. And I just, I'm sitting back and I just like keep saying this. And I don't know if he heard me or if he just knew that verse of the Bible. He's like, now I know it says in the Bible, you know, they won't believe, they won't hear Moses and the prophets, they won't believe if one rose from the dead, but don't you think some would? And I'm sitting back and I'm thinking, no, the Bible says they wouldn't. The Bible says they wouldn't. If they won't believe the Bible, they won't believe anything. And you might think that would be effective. You might think that somebody rising from the dead would make people believe, but no, they won't. And I, I listened to another preacher this week, a preacher I've got a lot of respect for, but he started making the whole argument about the Jews require a sign again. And these people, they say that all the time, and the Jews do require a sign. But they never read the rest of the passage. They don't read the verse in the Bible where it says a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And they don't read the verse where Jesus said no sign is going to be given except the sign of the prophet Jonas. And that was Jesus being three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And Jesus rose from the dead. And did the Jews believe after Jesus rose from the dead? No, they didn't believe even though one rose from the dead. Abraham was right. The Bible is right. Jesus rose from the dead and people don't believe. So why do we think they would believe the gospel if somebody else rose from the dead? Well, because they would get to see it for themselves. Well, here's the thing. If they see it for themselves, where's the faith? And we're saved by grace through faith. And listen, these these kind of things, these kind of arguments are ridiculous. And people, since the time of Christ, you know, they would say, you know, show us a sign. I'll show you some of these examples in a little bit. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. But listen, if people won't believe the Bible, they won't believe anything. And that's what Jesus was trying to teach in this story. And so in order to understand the full message, because there's a few lessons in here, there's three things really I think Jesus was trying to teach him. Whenever you look at a parable or a story like this, Jesus is using this story as an illustration. You always have to go back and you need to look at why he told this story. And so look at verse 14 of chapter 16. Look what it says in verse 14 before he gets to that story. It says, and the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things and they derided him. And now I wish I had time to preach chapters 11 through 16, but we don't, I've got plenty of time, but I don't know if y'all want to stay that long today. But if you go and you read all these stories, it all makes so much sense. But if last, when, if you look at the story of the prodigal son, uh, which was at the end of chapter 15, I showed how what that represented it, it's not so much about an individual salvation. It was a representative of God going to the Gentiles and the Gentiles being saved and the Gentiles receiving a part of the inheritance that was promised to the older brother, even though they had wasted theirs. And we know the Jews, they did not want to share in that inheritance. And they didn't like that. You know what? Because they, they were greedy. They were covetous. They hated Gentiles. They even hated the Samaritans that were partially related to them. I mean, they hated everybody that wasn't a Jew. And they didn't like it when Jesus sat and he ate with publicans and sinners. They didn't like that. And Jesus told them, the publicans and the harlots, they're going to go into the kingdom of God before you. Why? Because these people had faith. They believed on Jesus Christ. The Jews didn't. And they were covetous. They were greedy. The kingdom of God to them, it was all about it a physical kingdom that they could have where they were going to rule, where they would have possession over everything. They, they were greedy. And they still are to this day. And we see here that it said, he mentions these Pharisees, they were covetous. 
They were all about possessions. To them, you know, godliness was gain. There's still people that think that way today. That think if you've got a lot of money, if you've got a lot of possessions, that that means you've got the blessing of God on your life. I can't tell you how many times I've gone into churches that churches that don't even preach very good doctrine, but boy, they've got these massive buildings. They've got all these possessions. They've got the nice fancy chandeliers and people will walk through those places. Wow, the Lord sure is blessing. When did, when did we start thinking that possessions meant God's blessing? Where did we get that? What scripture do you see that in the Bible? That's not it, folks. You know, people do, they'll show off their fancy cars and their fancy house. Look how much God's blessing me. And listen, I'm, I'm all for being thankful. But, you know, your possessions, okay, your Rolex, your or whatever you're wearing, those do not mean you have the blessing of God. Now, the Jews thought that. That was a thinking among the Pharisees. You know, they loved wearing the fancy garments. They loved the big titles. They loved all those things. They loved all that pomp and circumstance. But you know what? That God didn't care about that one bit. But they were. They were covetous. They didn't like these stories that Jesus had told in chapter, Luke chapter 15. We don't have time to go through everything. But look what it says in verse um, 15. And He said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John, since at that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it, and it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than for one tittle of the law to fail. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. And then he goes into the story of the rich man and Lazarus. What's going on here? And I, it's really it's a lot more clear if you read all these chapters before it. We don't have time to do that. I'm not going to do that to you today. But the truth is, this conversation it actually started in Luke chapter 14 and 15. That's and that's where we see the publicans and sinners sitting with Jesus. Jesus giving the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. And so, you know, the Jews, they didn't like the idea. Jesus is kind of showing those parables how, you know what, I'm going to the Gentiles. I'm going to the sinners. I'm going to the down and outers. And they are going to share in the inheritance. They are going to have part in the kingdom of God. In fact, they're going to have part in the kingdom of God before you even do. And they didn't like hearing that. But that was all throughout those chapters. And so, uh, in the beginning of chapter 16, Jesus, he gives that parable of the unjust steward. It's one of the things. It, it kind of goes along with that. And it's clear the Pharisees, they were covetous. They did not want to share the inheritance with the Gentiles. They wanted an earthly inheritance. They didn't want a heavenly one, which is what it was all about. And Jesus, he tried to teach them about keeping, you know, about heavenly things, but they would not believe him. They would not believe his words. They thought, and they thought they were keeping the law. They thought they were okay. They thought they were special because of their bloodline. They were righteous in their own eyes, but only in their own eyes. God did not see them as righteous one bit. God saw them as sinners. And Jesus tells them here in this passage, you know, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass than one jot or one tittle of the law to fail. And then he brings up a law about marriage and divorce, one that the Pharisees had kind of overruled, one that they weren't keeping. And he was trying to teach them here that none of you have kept the law. None of you have kept the law, but there are some among you, some among the Gentiles, some among the down and outers that believe my words. And some of you, there's some of you that believe and there's some of you that don't. And that's what makes the difference. And so one of the things that Jesus was trying to teach in this parable here and to kind of understand why he was teaching this lesson too, you got to go into some of the earlier chapters. We don't have time to do that. But one thing that we need to understand that Jesus wanted to teach these Pharisees through this story of the rich man and Lazarus is that just because things are good in this life doesn't mean they're going to be good in the next life. And look what it says, and look what it says in verse 25. He said, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, 
and thou art tormented. How many of us have done that before? We've been like Pharisees. We look at people that are going through hard times. Maybe they're, maybe they have physical problems. Maybe they're having financial problems. And we'll look at these people and we'll be down on them. And we think, you know, they must be wicked people. They must be terrible people. Look at their life. And then we see these rich people. We see the people that have got it all going for them. They've got the nice cars, the nice houses. And we think, wow, those people are really blessed of God. You know, who are we, we going to listen to? Are we going to listen to the person with all the possessions? Or are we going to listen to the person with nothing? Who are you going to listen to? The preacher preaching to you know, a big mass of in a big mass of palace to thousands or the guy in a little place that has crummy air conditioning, you know, to a smaller crowd, you know, who are you going to listen to? I'm complaining about that today because it's hot. You know, who are you going to listen to? And you know, a lot of people, they're going to judge on all those other things. They're going to judge on all those outward things. That's what the Pharisees did. They were the people with the money. They were the people with the positions. They were, and so people went to them like they were the ones that had the answers. But Jesus said, you know what? This, here, there was a rich man. He was clothed in purple and fine linen. He fared sumptuously every day. There was a beggar. He just wanted to eat the crumbs. He, I mean, he was laid at the gate full of sores. Dogs licked his sores. This man was gross. He was disgusting. But you know what? Here's what happened. They both died. Both of them, their lives ended. Both of them. All of us are going to die one of these days. But you know what? That beggar, he ended up in heaven. There he is in Abraham's bosom, in the embrace of Abraham, who you claim to be your father. He's in the embrace of Abraham. He's entered into heaven. He is being comforted. And that rich man was being tormented. And he's begging for Lazarus to just give him a drop of water. I think it's interesting that he, he wanted that just Lazarus to give him a drop of water. He's thinking, maybe he's thinking, I deserve that because I gave him crumbs from my table. Surely I deserve at least a drop of water from him. Once again, that mentality of I deserve, you know, I've earned. That's why a lot of people think they're going to heaven because they've earned it. But folks, it's not about that. And so here he is. You know, everybody's thinking because these people are rich, that means they're right. That means they're righteous. But you know, everything was great for that rich man. Everything was horrible on earth for Lazarus, but it was completely opposite in the next life. And Lazarus is still enjoying the comforts of heaven while the rich man is still 2,000 years later enduring the torments of hell. So really, are we going to judge things? Are we going to judge truth off of people's circumstances, off their possessions? Because people are doing that. Are you going to judge who's telling the truth by what church is the biggest church, what church is the fanciest church, or by who's preaching the law and the prophets? Who's preaching the Word of God? What are you going to go off of? And you can, you can go off all those outward things like the Pharisees did, like people all over this country are doing, but Jesus has warned you and He said, you know what, I wouldn't pay attention to those things because let me tell you about this rich man. Let me tell you about this beggar. Let me show you what, how things were reversed in the next life. And I think we need to make sure that we say, you know what, I'm basing it all on what the Word of God says. You know, I'm not going to look at the building. I'm not going to look at... I, I'm, are they preaching the Scriptures? And listen, I thank God some of the churches I know, some of the pastors I'm friends with, you look at their building, it's nothing to be impressed with. It's nothing that people aren't, they're not going to go walk through there, wow, the Lord sure is blessing. You know, God sure has been good to you. Look at their building. They, the preachers don't do that in their places. But let me tell you something, they're preaching the truth. They're preaching the Word of God. And you know what? I wouldn't trade that for nothing. That's the most important thing that you could look at. But those Jews, they required a sign instead of trusting in the Word of God. Turn back to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11 and verse 14. It says, and he, and he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb, and it came to pass when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. And some of them said, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And others tempting him, sought him a sign from heaven. This was a sin. They're tempting Jesus. Okay, The devil tried to tempt Jesus, didn't he? And what did Jesus tell the devil? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. They're wanting a sign. But he knowing their thoughts said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against itself, against the house, falleth. And so Jesus, he didn't give them a sign. He just 
He preaches to them. He gives them the Word of God. Why? Because trusting in signs, they can be deceiving. I've preached messages about the danger of looking for signs. It is a foolish thing to do, and it's a wicked and adulterous generation that seeketh after a sign. Luke chapter 29 and verse 30... or. Uh, or verse, I'm sorry, uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 29. I was like, there's no Luke 29. Uh, verse 29 says, And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign. And there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. Jesus Christ was the only sign they were ever going to get. We've got people today still talking about how there's these new signs that are going to come. You know, when we get raptured for the Jews so they can receive Christ because they require a sign. No, they got their sign. Jesus rose from the dead and they, they rejected it. If they weren't going to believe His words, they weren't going to believe anything. I don't care what happens. I don't care if the Left Behind series and all the things it teaches is true about the rapture. They wouldn't believe. If, if we were all here, if I'm preaching the Gospel to... A bunch of Jewish people that have rejected the Word of God and we all just disappeared in the rapture just like that, they're still not going to believe. Okay, Signs won't work. If people won't believe the Word of God, they won't believe anything. They would just, well, how are they going to explain that? Well, they're just going to spin it that aliens abducted us or the planet got rid of us because we're so bad for the environment or something. You know, They're, they're going to come up with some way to spin it and they're not going to believe the truth of the Bible. And if you don't believe, because if you don't believe God's word, you won't believe anything. So that first thing Jesus was trying to teach them is that, you know, just because things are good in this life doesn't mean they're going to be good in the next life. And that's why we need to care so much more about heavenly things. We should care so much more about laying up treasures in heaven instead of on earth because, you know, it, life is not about what's here on earth. It's about what's to come. It's forever. It's eternal. And we should not get caught up in those things. And the second thing he was trying to teach them is that if you don't believe God's Word, you won't believe anything. If they won't believe most of the prophets, they won't believe the one rose from the dead. Look at Luke chapter 24 and verse 44. Look what he says there. He said, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then open he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. After This is after Jesus' resurrection, and he, he starts preaching these people, and he's telling them, what's he doing? He's quoting Old Testament. He's quoting Moses, and the prophets, and the Psalms. Why? Because the Old Testament is all about Jesus Christ. The, Old Te- the gospel is all over the Old Testament. Jesus is all over the Old Testament. And don't let ever let anyone convince you or fool you into thinking that the Jews believe the Old Testament. They don't. Jesus told them they don't. John chapter 5, verse 46, Jesus is talking to the Jews because they said, you know, we have Moses and the prophets. And He said, for had ye believed Moses, ye would, believe, ye would have believed Me for he wrote of me, but if you believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? They didn't believe the Old Testament, and that's why they didn't believe Jesus. They didn't believe the Bible, therefore they didn't believe they didn't believe God. And we need to understand that that, that is the case. That is, it's still that way today. Those who are truly born again are those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, how does and how does a person believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, they believe what the Word of God says. Okay, how, how do we learn about Christ? Well, somebody preached to us, right? Well, what did they preach from? They preached from the Word of God. Okay, we don't just make these things up. All right, we have we have the Word of God, and so what kind of happens too? And this is sometimes people, uh, many times we overthink things. Okay, and a lot of the things we overthink are really they're very simple in the Bible because it's like all right. This, you know, this salvation thing, you know, by grace through faith, a lot of people struggle with it. And you'll go and you'll, you know, we'll go out door knocking, we'll preach the gospel to them, and they'll say things like, those are just man's words. You know, or they'll say, you know, why should I believe you? You know, your church says this, another church says that, you know, how do I know that you're telling me the truth? 
And then a lot of times if we're not careful, we'll make the mistake of trying to convince them why we're better than you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses or, or somebody else, or why Baptists are better than this religion or that religion. And that, I'm telling you, that's a waste of time. When you try doing that, that's a huge waste of time because here's the thing. When it comes to who's going to get saved and who's not going to get saved, it actually does come down to do they believe you or do they not believe you? Now, wait a minute, that sounds kind of arrogant, doesn't it? But let me, let me show you a few things from the Bible. Uh, turn over Romans chapter 10 and verse 12. Romans chapter 10 and verse 12. It says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So how, how can a person believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, they have to hear about it. Well, who do they hear from? They hear from a preacher. They hear from one of us. Okay, We are the ones who give them the gospel. Where do we get our gospel from? We get it from the Bible. Well, where did the Bible come from? It came from the very mouth of God. And you all understand that when people reject us, they're not, it's not us they're rejecting, it's God they're rejecting. It's God Himself. Look what it says in John chapter 15, verse 20. Jesus speaking, he says, Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Okay, so listen, as long as we're preaching the gospel, as long as our message lines up with the word of God, when we're out there, this isn't about them believing us over the Jehovah's Witnesses or believing us over some other group or them believing me over one other person. This is about them believing the message itself. And it's very clear here what the Bible teaches is you know, if, if they believe when you, when you preach the word of God to them, then they believe the Word of God. And if they believe the Word of God, they believe Jesus. And if they believe Jesus, they believe God. You see, we've got a lot of people out there today that say, well, I believe the Bible, but then they, they won't believe our message. When we come to them, you know, hey, do you believe the Bible's the Word of God? Well, yeah, I believe the Bible's the Word of God. What do you think you have to do to get to heaven? Well, you've got to be a good person. You know, you just got to, you got to do your best. You've got to do good works. And then we'll show them what the Bible says. And then they try to spin it like, no, you know, I believe the Bible, but I don't believe what you're telling me. Sorry, if you don't believe what I'm telling you, it's because you don't believe the Bible. You know, and, and they would never go as far as saying, I don't believe God. I don't believe Jesus. But listen, if you believe that you've got to do good works to get to heaven, you don't believe God. You don't believe Jesus. You don't believe the Bible. You don't believe any of it. It's all a package deal. And see, what happens is, many times we fall into this trap of thinking, I, I've got to convince them of me. And that's where you've got these lifestyle evangelist people, and I'm all for having a good testimony and everything, but if they're not going to believe the Word of God, they're not going to believe you because of your lifestyle. If they, you know, I'm all for, you know, I've talked about this before, I, I like the people who teach about creation and stuff like that, show the scientific evidence, but I think that's more for believers. Because... If they're not going to believe the Word of God, why would they believe science? It, it, it doesn't really make any sense to do that. People always want, you know, if we could just find Noah's Ark, you know, if we could just find this, we could find that, if we could find a dinosaur out there somewhere, you know, then people would all of a sudden believe creation. No, they wouldn't. They would, they're not going to believe. They could, they're, if they're not going to believe this Bible, if they're not going to believe our message, when we go to them preaching the Gospel the way God commanded us to do it, if they will not hear that, if they will not listen to that, they're not going to believe anything else. It's like, why doesn't God give us the ability to do miracles? If they're not going to believe the Word of God, they're not going to believe a miracle. We don't need to go there and do a magic show for them to try to get them to believe. If they're not going to believe the Word of God, I don't care how good your magic tricks are, they're not going to believe. And there are, there's believers and there's unbelievers. And here Jesus, He's talking, you know, and there's people, there's... Uh, you know, there's the Pharisees, the, what we would, you know, they would call the good people. You've got Jews, you've got publicans, you've got harlots, you've got Gentiles. And he's preaching to all these people, and he's treating them all like there's basically two groups, believers and unbelievers. 
And it doesn't matter what your title is on this earth. You know, what matters is, are you a believer or an unbeliever? And if you want to start looking at the outward things to figure out who's right, you're going to get it wrong every time. If you're all, if you all think that, you know, doing miracles or some kind of sign or doing something really convincing is going to, you know, get people to believe, well, you're wrong too, because if they won't believe the word of God, they won't believe anything. And we do many times we beat ourselves up and we go out soul winning, we give people the gospel. And it's like, man, you know, man, how did they not get it? You know, man, if, you know, if I could just done this, if I could have answered this historical question for them, then, you know, I, I probably would have won them over. No. If you couldn't win them over with the Romans Road, you're not going to win them over with anything. Oh, they really got me stumped with some of that scientific thing. You know, I, I just couldn't prove that, you know, young earth. You know, they were talking about the billions. I, I didn't know how to prove that. It doesn't matter. Even if you would have proved it, they wouldn't have believed. If they're not going to believe the gospel, they're not going to believe anything. And so G, the third thing Jesus was trying to teach them is that there's two kinds of people, believers and unbelievers. That's what it comes down to. It's not about who's rich and who's poor. It's not about who's blessed and who's, you know, uh, you know, who's miserable. It, it, not, it doesn't have anything to do with that. There's believers and unbelievers, and you can't tell the difference by who's blessed and who isn't. In Matthew 5, verse 44, he said, He maketh the rain upon the just and on the unjust. Jesus said, if people, if we're going to be able to let people know that we're his disciples, we have to show them by our good works because it rains on the just and on the unjust. Good things don't just happen to good people. And bad things don't just happen to bad people. Save people get sick. Save people get cancer. Save people die in automobile accidents. You know, we have, we have a lot of the same bad things happen to us that happen to lost people. You don't go off of that. But many people do. And so, you know, you're not going to be able to tell by those things. You can't tell by who's keeping the law. We're not going to figure out who's saved by, all right, who shows up at church the most? You know, who's doing, who's doing the most good works? Who looks the nicest? You know, if we did it, if we were to start filling off checklists of sins committed, who's going to, you know, who has the fewest check marks? Surely those are the ones who are saved, right? No, we wouldn't be able to figure it out from that. You know why? Because it's not about that. It's who's a believer and who's not a believer. That's the difference right there. And Jesus was trying to teach them that. So you know, we're suppo- that's why we're supposed to give the gospel to every creature because we can't tell who's going to believe and who won't. Some of the people I, I've given the gospel to that I least expected to get saved did get saved. And some of them, oh man, I've got this person. You know, man, yeah, you know, th- this is I can tell they're receptive, and they didn't get it. You, we don't know. So we give it to every creature. We give it to everybody because we can't tell. We're not going to go and look at somebody and say, man, that person, they're just way too deep in sin. You know, they're way too horrible. They're too far gone. No, we're going to give the gospel to them. God might save them. We don't know. If they believe, doesn't matter how bad they are, God will save them if they will believe. And so we're going to, we're going to give it to whoever. And you know, the Bible says it's easier for a rich man to go through the eye of a needle than into the kingdom of God. But... With man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. So we're not going to just forget about the rich people either. We're going to give them the gospel too. Some of them might get saved. We don't know. So be careful about stereotyping. You know, and if you just get rejected, move on to the next person. That's all you can do. Be careful you don't waste your time trying to use science and history, you know, uh, to, or, or even just your incredible gift of persuasion. Listen, if Jesus couldn't convince some people, you're not going to convince some people. You know, you just if people won't believe John 1.1, 1, 1, they're not going to believe Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. So don't waste your time. And I do, I think, I think all that other stuff, the creation stuff, you know, you've got those. I, I haven't read it, I heard about, you know, the Lee Strobel case for Christ, and he uses all these different uh, methods of investigation to prove Jesus actually existed. Well, you know what? If you won't. If you won't believe the Bible, they're not going to believe Lee Strobel's book either. You know, that's fine. I think that stuff encourages believers, but you don't need to give somebody Lee Strobel's book, and I haven't read it. It might be good, it might not be. You better give them a Bible. And if they won't believe that Bible, they won't believe anything. And so, you know, if we're going to make a difference, we have to do it with the Word of God. That's why we need to do everything we can to spread the message of God's Word. Word. We don't need to try to improve it. Okay? Oh, if we modernize it, it'd be better. No, we don't need to update it. 
We, you know, we don't need to water it down. Oh, we, we can't preach that. That stuff, that's too hard. That doesn't fit in this culture. Listen, we need to give the Word of God, I mean, straight and pure. We can't, we can't water down. That's not going to help. All oh, the people aren't going to listen if you, if you did. Well, we're not going to change their mind any, then at all. Either they're going to believe it or they're not going to believe it. The gospel is the power of God into salvation to everyone that believeth. And we can't make anyone believe anything. We can't do it. You can't make it. You can't make somebody believe something. You know what you can just do? You can just go fishing and just see who will. Just, I mean, just, you know, I've seen some guys, when they go out fishing, what are they, you know, they'll have three or four poles out there. Why are they doing that? You know, more poles, yeah, the more chance you have of catching something. And you know what? When you go soul winning, you get a lot of rejections. You get a lot of people who you give the gospel to and they don't believe. But you know what? You just keep doing it. Keep doing more and more and more. And you're going to get some of those people. We're going to find those that are out there who will believe the gospel. That's what it's all about. And that's why we need to do everything we can to spread the word of God. And some people, they're just not going to believe. Oh, you know, it was, it was my fault. You know, I just, I'm not eloquent enough. I stutter too much. Hey, if they heard the gospel and they didn't believe it, it had nothing to do with your ability. They rejected the word of God. They rejected God himself. And so that's, I believe, what Jesus was trying to teach in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. If they won't believe the Bible, they won't believe anything. And so what do we need to do? We just need to cast, you know, spread that seed, spread the word of God, and just hope it takes root somewhere. And you know what? It will. It will. There's going to be people who are going to believe, and those who don't believe, couldn't. Do, there wasn't anything else you could have done about. It. All we can do is spread the word. So with that, let's all stand together.